Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. One of the earliest episodes of this show was a conversation with my friend Ian Bennett of the Epoch Philosophy YouTube channel about Marxism. It's one of my favorite Reimagining Liberties so far, not just because Ian is tremendously smart and I learn a lot from him, but because it's the kind of conversation I find particularly valuable. A dive into a set of ideas I have many disagreements with, but are influential, interesting, and worth understanding. That's why I'm so happy to have Ian back today to talk about the Frankfurt School, critical theory, and cultural Marxism. As before, Ian and I differ rather dramatically on many political and economic issues. But given the role these ideas, or at least the specter of these ideas, plays in current culture war battles, it's important to explore them on their own terms and see how and where they conflict with the radical liberal perspective I'm building out on this show. And if you come away interested in understanding critical theory more thoroughly than we have time for in an hour-long podcast, I encourage you to check out Epoch Philosophy on YouTube. Ian creates short explainers on all the important ideas and thinkers, and does so with remarkable clarity and sophistication. What was the Frankfurt School, and I suppose, what was its relationship to what we might call textbook Marxism? The Frankfurt School was probably, I guess the best way you could say, uh, in simple terms, was a little bit more of an eclectic um, school of Marxist thinkers. Um, of course, they're, they were um, a bit of an offshoot from what we would think of Marxism proper, right? And uh, maybe the best way to visualize this was Marxism being the sort of cold calculus of economic systems and stuff of that nature, while the Frankfurt School was a little bit more concerned with inner subjectivity, right? The inner workings of self and art and creativity and the more elastic nature of society, I suppose. Um, so they um, essentially were kind of like a, a big molding of what we would, uh, what we describe as, as German idealism, roughly, um, Marxism, and then new emerging psychoanalysis. And when the Frankfurt School was roughly popping up uh, is when psychoanalysis was roughly popping up um, and thinkers such as Freud and um, people like uh, Adorno especially were very, very uh, influenced by people like as Freud. Um, and uh, stuff of that nature, I suppose. That's probably the best little synopsis, like the little <laughs> synopsis of uh, the main differences between critical theory and uh, Marxism. So it sounds like it would be fair to say that Marxism pre Frankfurt School was about analyzing class and economy production and so on, whereas the Frankfurt School pivoted that to psychology and culture. Yeah, that's probably the probably the best way that I would describe it. I know some people would probably be like, no, that's not that's not what they were doing. But um, well, not exactly what they were doing. That's definitely what they were doing. But um, I would say in really simple terms, that's absolutely probably the best way to describe those differences. So why the move to culture then and why specifically within a Marxist context or at least Marxist influence, because when we think of Marxism and we we look at the works of Karl Marx, and as we discussed it in in the podcast I did with you on Marxism a while back, that seems to be an analysis of the structural features of a society, the economic structural features of a society. And it's not clear how culture and psychology fit into that kind of analysis. Right. That's definitely within Marxism proper, as as we think of it, there really isn't much of uh, a psychology, if you will, um, a sort of inner subjective uh, kind of process for analyzing self as perhaps a more isolated phenomenon. Um, it's certainly the inklings were there, like a lot of writing with Marx and Engels uh, specifically and 
how we look at uh, more metaphysical phenomenon. Um, that's a bit, I, I, I see uh, some inklings there with Marx and Angles, but definitely as a whole, you don't see that much within Marxism proper. So I, I guess for the, the reasoning and the, the purpose for this kind of offshoot, there, there's a couple reasons, right? Like one, we can say, you know, is philosophical, right? Abstractly, they're just progressing through finding little holes within some of the older dialogue. But I don't, I think with the Frankfurt School that often gets missed is there's a lot of really, I wouldn't say get missed, gets missed, but it's, uh, sometimes not talked about uh, as much as I think it should be. And that's more of like just the real core political socioeconomic happenings that were uh, taking place during that time. Um, so you saw the rise of fascism uh, across Europe and uh, really uh, across the globe in many uh, respects. Um, you saw um, Marxism, Leninism starting to take hold as sort of like a, uh, not only a proper sort of philosophy, but, um, uh, a socioeconomic system and experiment happening. So a lot of weird stuff was happening, uh, within the beginning of the 20th century. And the Frankfurt school, I think was very, very concerned, even on not just, you know, philosophical abstract levels, but very material as well. And that, that often gets missed. And, I, I think it it makes sense for the Frankfurt School to just pop up at kind of like the early 20th century because it was just such a heavy click of like a new era. Just for some weird reason, I feel like, I don't know, maybe maybe you agree, disagree. Uh, I, a lot of my background is history. I feel like the beginning of the 20th century was extremely interesting. Like there was just this rapid explosion of a lot of different stuff that, I mean... He, I mean, of course, like, uh, you know, the the process of history isn't so linear, but um, it, it's it's like, man, the minute we hit <laughs> 1900 stuff got really, really weird all of a sudden. And I think that the Frankfurt School kind of represents that weirdness by um, popping up as this real weird mesh of different philosophical camps and I, I, ideas and, and fields. Um, you know, again, they, they pull from psychoanalysis, they pull from Marxism, they pull from existentialism. Um, and in, and in some respects, more original German idealism. That's another thing that gets lost is that almost pre Marxism itself as we can maybe understand it. Um, yeah. Can you give us the thumbnail sketch of what German idealism is? Yeah, so um, that's also that's a bit of a, a tough one to describe in some in some ways. But German idealism roughly is kind of described as uh, a type of uh, kind of like a, a philosophical field emerging out of out of Germany, and roughly I want to say from around the 1700s to the I, maybe we could say all the way to. You know, the mid 1800s, the end of the 1800s, it was a, a good maybe I want to say around like a 200 year period, roughly from people like Kant to Hegel to even Nietzsche. And um, I guess the important thing to kind of point out in a philosophical context is uh, idealism. So understanding sort of kind of the. Um, inner subjective uh, metaphysical dealings with what we would describe as in the camp of philosophy is, is idealism, which is um, roughly the understanding of this is very crude, but I, I think it's almost important to describe it in this way so that people who don't quite have a grasp on this can at least take hold of something, some sort of essence and idea of what idealism is roughly the, I want to say metaphysical or like the uh, natural understanding of the world through uh, the lens of ideas <laughs> or ideals or um, sort of uh, perspective, uh, abstract notions of, of of things. Right. So, for example, uh, we can make if we're on the topic of Marxism, we can make a, a, a very distinct uh, difference between idealism and materialism. Um, roughly, we can view these things as sort of opposites. Um, Hegel uh, essentially saw, who was a German idealist, saw history as uh, a set sort of foundational um, ideas 
of what is roughly we can say kind of agreed upon or, or things that happened uh, in the past through uh, almost the abstract lens of ideas. While Marx kind of flipped that, Marx and Engels both were like, no, we, we see history through the lens of real, raw, material, foundational happenings, right? Uh, through economic orders, um, the rise and fall of society, and um, stuff of that nature. So um, that's probably the most crude, but I want to say the most understandable, maybe, I, I hope, uh, way to describe that. And, and, and German idealism really um, was just firmly planted in a, in a very specific type of philosophy, I guess we can say, from Kant is... Kant was roughly concerned with understanding what were the limits and bounds of philosophy, right? Because around the time of Kant, like science, as we know, um, was really starting to take hold. And there realistically was this kind of question is like, oh, man, man, we're really hitting the limits of philosophy. And Kant, I want to say, was really trying to stretch those limits uh, immensely. Hegel um, kind of definitely influenced by Kant but definitely took a really weird approach through more um, a metaphysical uh, endeavor into philosophy. Kant wasn't so metaphysical in many ways, at least like he wanted to understand um, what we could see as nature. But a lot of, you know, obviously like with Kant, I think this is something that even a lot of people know that don't really study philosophy, but Kant thought that just there wasn't a lot that we could know there was things outside of our scope of grasp and understanding and you know there's reality uh that we don't understand roughly and he called that the noumena and hegel hegel kind of i want to say probably kind of disagreed a little bit like no we can understand a lot more about reality and and, and nature um, but he did it through the concept of dialectics and through roughly the, the concept of process. Um, and then I think the, the the last figure of German idealism, roughly speaking, is uh, there's a lot in between here uh, from Fichte to uh, Stirner, tons of other people. But I want to say the last big figure of German idealism was Nietzsche. And um, the, you go from Kant, Hegel to Nietzsche. They are such different characters. But I want to say Nietzsche and his real radical critique of modernity and uh christianity um that is the the big i think kind of explosive end of german idealism as we know it so the frankfurt school is taking all of these influences that we've discussed and doing cultural analysis but they're still like the marxists they see their project as critiquing capitalism and capitalist society. Is that correct? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, they they do. Uh, there is a specific type of critique that seems to be fairly different from a lot of other uh, traditional Marxists. Um, the Frankfurt School, and I, I think this is another interesting thing for, for people listening or watching. I think this might hit them more as a person. I found this. Uh, again, I consider, you know, I tried to uh, discern the Marxism proper as the cold calculus, right, of of uh, philosophy. The Frankfurt School, I think, is a lot more personal in a way, if you will. Um, the, the Frankfurt School was concerned about capitalism through, right, like culture. And uh, and what does that mean, right? Like, what, what about cultures? Well, a lot of it's really art. Uh, and, and creativity and how we can kind of or kind of like interact with in a, in a creative context. Right. So I, I think the, the the real bedrock, the kind of beginning of critical theory in, in the Frankfurt schools, roughly through, I want to say, probably Walter Benjamin. Um, and he wrote an essay that was uh, very popular. Um, I always kind of butcher this at first. The um, it is the the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And that's one of his most, probably his most popular essay. And he he's, Benjamin was very concerned at uh, the, the new prospect of, of a mechanical type of capitalism that is so hinged upon production, right? Where we need to pump things out for profit, for, for productivity's sake, that we lose a type of essence and art, right? Whereas Marx would have seen the, you know, there's, there's issues with, 
the the concept of you know like uh uh wage labor and 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 newer i, I guess newer concrete issues there although i want to say i think alienation is something that kind of there's a big there's a big line between the frankfurt school and and marx and that's kind of the concept of alienation because it's kind of like an idealistic kind of <laughs> uh it's it's a type of ideal in a way if you if you if you want to say that um and we covered a, a lot of alienation on that that last podcast um but uh yeah the frankfurt school w- was concerned about alienation but maybe perhaps we can say that um, it was an alienation, maybe in a deeper context of of the 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 specificities of life, right? Of art, relationship, interaction, um, and and stuff of that nature. Um, and of course, uh, art in the age of mechanical reproduction. I think we can kind of deduce from the the title that um, Benjamin was concerned with uh, art uh, as a a reproductive, just constant churning out uh, sort of profitable endeavor. It it stripped the essence of art as we know it. And I I think like every, every um, critical theorist from Adorno to Horkheimer to um, Lukacs, uh, there was this underbelly of uh of concern for art i think you just use the phrase critical theory so to clarify um especially because critical theory is a term that is on a lot of people's lips right now oh, yeah. during the culture war does critical theory just refer to the theory of the frankfurt school yeah so um <sighs> So that's kind of a, a hard one. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely that that one's on my mind uh, at times too. I, I, I tell people roughly my the, the big kind of area in philosophy that I'm into is critical theory. Um, critical theory certainly isn't just the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School is a type of critical theory, I would say. Um, realistically, I, I almost kind of consider critical theory as something a lot more broad in the sense from like critical philosophers in a way i almost consider critical theorists from like even the frankfurt school to uh all the way to like zizek i consider zizek really a 90s philosopher i know he's still doing stuff today but really the core of what we think of of zizek uh is is kind of a you know 1990s uh, late 80s kind of uh philosopher and uh people in between i almost consider i know there's this would definitely be very debatable and uh hotly contested i almost feel like people like derrida and and foucault even though they are and we can get into this i know that that you're interested in this but uh, as as more post-modern or post-structural figures um and those they differ a lot from people like uh the more notable uh people in the frankfurt school such as adorno and marcuse and uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, but I almost consider them like in a way, um, critical theorist. Um, I guess we can say the, the main thing that people think of like most common people, because it's just, it's saturated the public, (laughs) the public discourse sphere thing is, uh, (laughs) critical race theory and critical race theory doesn't really have anything to do with critical, not even just like the Frankfurt school, but critical theory proper. It's, um, critical race theory is, is really just kind of, uh, (laughs) a branch of legal studies. Um, I, I guess it can have some relation, right? With, its approach right it's a, a critical type of endeavor um but you know it's it's uh in the field of, of legal studies concerning um you know american culture and society and, and primarily though uh legality and how um culture racism and whatever has <laughs> of course interfered with uh, uh the legal system but very different <laughs> okay so they have a critique of capitalist modernity 20th century capitalist societies and as we we talked about in the last episode on marx this doesn't capitalism means something different than simply free markets it's a it's more of a way of structuring society a profit driven culture a control by corporations or an emphasis on the firm and so on um and and if they're looking at this through the context of art, I guess can you give us a sense of what they saw as the problem? Because if you just tell me 
you know, capitalism has enabled us to mass produce art, selling it at a profit, but now art, instead of being the purview of the person who can go to the museum to see it hanging on the wall or the person who can afford to attend the opera is now something that is accessible. I can have that same painting now as a poster hanging up in my house or I can listen to recordings of that opera anytime I want to and I don't need to be upper class to do it. What's the problem with that? So um, I, I don't think we can, it's almost impossible to describe it as the problem in a singular context. Um, these, especially when it comes to the Frankfurt School, if we're going to take their approach, um, it, it's 100% things get weird and multivaried um, at this point. Um, I mean, there's a, a number of problems, right? We can look at the, if we're, if we're pulling from a lot of sort of Marxian perspectives, there is the problem of just raw materiality, right? Where there is this huge difference in kind of um, material, um, oh, like a uh, uh, ownership, right? Like uh, the ownership of property and, and wealth. There is such a, a, a wide stratification of the the poor and, and the rich. Um, and, and especially during the time, I mean, we're, we arguably, I think this is the interesting thing. I'm trying to compare this to make this easier for people to, to our current, uh, you know, point in time. I think almost wealth inequality in today is actually worse. I think like technically speaking, like, like, uh, like, from the data itself i think it might be worse today but i think back in the the uh the the time of the 1800s and the the industrial revolution it was more felt right it may not have been quite as wide but certainly the effects of that inequality were much larger uh from the time of factory workers and and um factory owners or capitalists if you will um so there is the material issue right where uh i think a lot of marxists were concerned with like capitalism just isn't able to function um uh efficiently like it just in a way like as a way to um to kind of organize and manage society it's really insufficient uh at um kind of maintaining a sort of um uh structural um i want to say uh Con like almost a concreteness like a way to gauge society as something that's reliable in a way uh, there's a lot of ebbs and flows that are on the the basis of of markets and and resource extraction uh and it's essentially built upon the idea uh or not even really the idea the foundation of infinite growth within a world that has finite materials um so that's the in and, and, and roughly the Frankfurt School, they they bring that with them. That is the I think that is a, an approach and a critique of capitalism that they still hold firm in their heart. Then there is the, the the sort of the again, the inner subjective problem, the, the cultural problem, which is what the Frankfurt School is more known for. Uh, that being, you know, the, the kind of effect that it capitalism has on self we can see the changing of values right um, um we can see um how and this is when it gets real interesting with like people like adorno and uh you know later critical theorists is that they're, they're also concerned with like desire right desire philosophers have been concerned with desire forever uh and, and freud really was concerned with desire um, and, and kind of what that means and how we deal with des uh, desire, right? Uh, you know, uh, liberal and, and modern philosophers were very concerned with that. But I, I think stuff starts really changing when you get to Freud, as Freud sees kind of desire as he's kind of one of the first theorists that um, kind of says that, like, we desire things, but in order for us to live in a society, we suppress those desires, and that's where Adorno and, and people like the Frankfurt School really come in with that, that idea is how capitalism essentially forces us to uh, really like really suppress these sort of human desires. Right. And you got to think about during the time of like, uh, <laughs> you know, like the early 20th century, a lot of uh, sexism, a, a lot of, uh, you know, different types of, you know, in ways stuff we're still dealing with today, but maybe in, in a more concrete way of uh, xenophobia, stuff of that nature, where um, there is 
you know, not only the the pre-modern um, sort of religious or, or ideal foundation of those uh, isms, but now capitalism is is really kind of co-opting that uh, sort of ideological practice and uh, marketing it and uh, pushing these sort of uh, foundational beliefs into the the sort of uh, capitalist system as a whole, and they're definitely looking at how. Essentially, I guess the best easy way from this to describe this is how capitalism co-ops our creativity, how it controls essentially um, our artistic sort of creativity and how our desire and our want for things in life come from the context of what is profitable, of what um, is seen as productive. Um, And they're pretty concerned with that. And that's kind of. I want to say those, if I can say the the two problems uh, for simplicity's sake, I think those are probably the two biggest problems that the Frankfurt School see with capitalism. So there's there's a lot to unpack there, and it a lot of it is around a reaction that I have often had when I am reading either contemporary Marxists or. Frankfurt School Marxism and their critiques of capitalism is is the the historical analysis and the I guess we'll call it the comparative the comparative institutional analysis because they'll make an argument say that capitalism kind of creates this thirst for um, for material goods that your your happiness comes from owning stuff and that you're never quite satisfied with what you own because in order for capitalism to sell you more stuff, it has to convince you that the the thing you bought yesterday is not as the good as the thing you could buy today. And so if you just get the thing today, you will, you know, now now you'll be happy, but then it's going to turn around and tomorrow is going to tell you, oh, now this new thing is is the next better thing. Um, or it's going to try to emphasize these differences, the sexism, the racism, xenophobia, and so on as a way to sell products to you, or it's going to, it's going to structure your relationships with others. And a lot of this, a lot of the the individual critiques, when they point out what look like kind of pathologies or things that would be better if we changed them, sound plausible. But I guess where I end up having a real issue with, with a lot of this is None of these things necessarily strike me as unique to capitalism or contemporary modern capitalism per se. So as you said, I mean, racism, sexism, xenophobia have been around forever and have been weaponized and operate and like operationalized by people in power. Um, by various factions in order to drive their own interests for as long as I mean as long as we have history, we can find examples of that or or the kind of constant thirst for the next thing as a way to make us happy. you know like i'm I'm a Buddhist, and the the fundamental problem that the Buddha set out to solve in you know fourth or fifth century BCE India was exactly that like we can find happiness through just the next thing and it certainly was not a capitalist society at the time and so i i guess my question is it's one thing to raise concerns about contemporary society but how do they argue that these concerns are novel and brought about by capitalism as opposed to capitalist society just being yet another kind of society and social and economic arrangement that happens to surface a lot of the same concerns that have been present for kind of as long as humanity's been around. So that is a wonderful question. It is the most common question I see with Marxism as a whole. And it's something that is kind of kind of there is such a narrative around Marxism and that is one of those kind of 
I'm not going to say false narratives because it's it's a, it's a decent from from how we view Marxism. It is it, it's very easy to come to that kind of conclusion. Like what is so different about capitalism versus the things that past? This is where exactly where um, it, God, it's a meme at this point. Like, oh, if you read Marx, you'd understand. No, Marx talks about this. Like even early Marx, nonetheless, people like uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, which are way almost in, in a way way more vocal about this phenomenon of these things existing uh before capitalism but yeah um the the issue with capitalism uh, in these issues such as racism xenophobia and the the desire for more or whatever is that essentially capitalism has allowed it to become the most powerful it it has in any other period of time whether that be from um feudalism to you know the the sort of con- the the sort of spiritual concerns like you said of of eastern buddhism and and religion uh, and that nature and um, it's not that these things are innate and specific to capitalism, but that the uh, the concentration of those issues are at almost the the largest it's ever been, if that makes sense. Um, at least in their eyes, I think that's how they they see it. But this is also happening at a time when you know, the, the rise of global capitalism is happening at a time when we have seen movements for racial justice we have seen it certainly has not been a it's not been a steady line of progress but we have seen decreases in um racist and sexist attitudes the rise of women's rights the civil rights movement so it would seem that if if capitalism has accentuated and centered these kinds of things, we wouldn't necessarily be seeing the kinds of social progress that have come along with it. Yeah. So this is where this is where and and you know it's good that we're on the kind of the topic of critical theory because this is kind of where critical theory really really shines. Um this is where uh if we can describe what capitalism is, um realistically I, I think and and I this is roughly my approach to capitalism. Um, and I think most critical theorists or philosophers today would see it as such. We, I think in a lot of ways, the traditional way of looking at capitalism is this iron train that bulldozes through things, right? It destroys it. Um, it, uh, it, it's linear. It's, it's singular in nature in such a way. And that's kind of almost in a way the, the capitalism that Marx and Engels describe. Um, it, it may be even the Marxist Leninists of the world. And then there's the capitalism, which I think is more, I think, probably more accurate. And that's the living, breathing entity that is flexible, that changes, that uh, it is all encompassing and uh, saturating of I- ideology of the different types of things. It's adaptable and it changes itself in accordance to what's happening in culture and stuff. And I think that that's realistically, I think that is the 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 most realistic uh, description of what we think capitalism is. And um, so I, I think it's that um, I think it's that that here where critical theorists kind of that's where we start getting that sort of foundational idea of of, of capitalism and it being like this uh, breathing entity that uh, changes and, and evolves and such. And yes, they it evolves around the newer concepts of of um, sort of uh, of uh, like newer like like emancipation, whether that be from like sort of racist ideals or, or uh, you know homophobic ideals of the of the past, the sort of um, bigoted superstitions and stuff. Capitalism is is very much able to uh, evolve uh, past those types of superstitions if it deems itself profitable to do so. Um, and I think that's realistically, it's not that capitalism is an inherently racist or, or uh, it, it, people do make this idea. And I, I, I think like I see the approach here, like because I, I can see how capitalism itself in a material context can reinforce a lot of prior racist systems or like the uh, a racist kind of effect of like material um what can we say uh inadequacy or, or like wealth divides between you know black and white people and um 
it's hard for capitalism to change on a material front, right? Redistributing that that type of wealth and such. That's where capitalism is very hard at kind of changing. Thus, I think the the kind of conclusion that a lot of people come to, which I don't think is entirely incorrect, that capitalism in a sense is like it has these sort of foundational things uh, within racism that it protects. Um, yet at the same time, this is the contradiction. We can go into like the you'll hear this a lot within capitalism and and, and marxist or, or critical theorist is the the contradictions within capitalism and that's roughly kind of comes from the mental um i guess the perspective of dialectics and looking at things through that that's kind of like a whole thing in itself i don't want to dive too much into dialectics um but that that's kind of the, the the weird odd contradiction is that capitalism is simultaneously emancipatory in many ways yet uh oppressive in another respect so i think the emancipatory thing is the social progress that we see uh, and that's very real that's a that's a real thing that can't be you know a lot of a lot of people who are very anti-capitalist um when they look at it singular that is one thing that they're often very quiet about uh, or they you know whatever but um that I, I do see is is a very real thing capitalism is very good at sort of bringing upon like a, this this kind of processual um processual like emancipatory idealisms that we see that are kind of popping up with like you know like you know the kind of the the falling apart of like homophobia and these weird superstitions of the past that's very real what what doesn't happen or that what what's a lot more i guess difficult for capitalism to parse is the existing material inequality that exists for these groups of people one aspect of we'll call it like traditional marxism was this kind of inevitability of a certain sort of social progress and namely it would be eventually the the workers would the workers would rise up overthrow the capitalist system um, and and replace it with with something else something better etc and and we saw you know we saw the the russian revolution as the you know, the preeminent example of this this workers revolution but the west but the the russian revolution didn't end up with a workers paradise it ended up with stalinism uh, and and so does part of the frankfurt school's project in explaining basically why it is that we're not getting what marx anticipated and in in western you know they a lot of these guys fled nazi germany came to the us um several of them ended up living in in los angeles kind of the epicenter of capitalist consumerism and the movie industry and the the glitz and dazzle of celebrity and so on um and and so were they wrestling with the fact that it seemed that the workers didn't want what marx was selling and seemed happy enough with getting all of this stuff with the the materialism with the wage labor and so on like what yeah. is that part of the cultural analysis so, is basically the culture wasn't <laughs> embracing what we were told the workers actually wanted yeah so i guess no those are man those are those are the kind of things the the kind of <laughs> it's kind of a corny meme but like oh yeah those questions those are the questions i like no but really um i think those are that those are the kind of real interesting sort of historical things uh that are very multivaried and complex but but interesting at the same time um yeah so when it comes to critical theory and critical theorist uh roughly i think you're you're talking about the those the the marxist experiments of the past such as the uh russian revolution why did they kind of devolve into realistically like when you look at theory uh, as as marxian theory goes the soviet union was I, I don't I know there's some debate within Marxist. I cannot for me personally, I'm, I'm putting my own thought into this and uh, I don't know how else to look at this, um, but I can't see 
like what about like a, a sort of uh, a, a, what we would call a communist China or a communist Russia or, you know, these socialist experiments? I cannot see anything in those systems that really get at the core of even what Marx was talking about as even socialism. Right. So there's kind of two two things here. Socialism being the kind of transitional state. Uh, to uh, communist society as a stateless, classless society being communism, not even within the description of what they give as as a socialist society do does the USSR or China even really embody? And I know there's a lot of there's a lot of people who would definitely say that's a very idealistic, non uh, ahistorical way of looking at you know these these political experiments. Um, but I guess since we're talking about critical theory, we can kind of lean into that. That's roughly the kind of the kind of critique that uh, the Frankfurt School had of Marxism Leninism. They were pretty critical of Marxism Leninism as a whole, and um, I think that was the I think that is a, that is a very foundational question, right? I, I think earlier I said that like, critical theorists are also concerned about the the political happenings. Uh, that are happening throughout Europe. I think that is one of the things that they they saw. It's like, why is the USSR turning out exactly as it is? Um, and the, the, there, I think there's there's a lot of different things, right? Um, one, um, I think there probably is like the this like you were saying the inner subjective sort of happenings of like workers almost in a way don't want what they really want. And you see in later philosophy, that's really explored. Um, like later in the 20th century, that's where that's where a lot of other philosophers like really hone in on that idea. We're like, man, they the world really, we think that we want what we often, you know, like we, we don't really want the things we think we want. But back to critical theory as a whole, that is kind of a central question. Um, and, and then the the other sort of glaring dilemma here is the kind of all encompassing power dynamics of geopolitics at the time. Um, this is something I I, I kind of try to explain to people, not as like an like uh, what will we say like a, an excuse of uh, a lot of the the terrible, really actually pretty terrible things that happened in uh, the USSR, um, China, um, in states such as those, but. Um, we have to look at these things as geopolitics is something very, very all encompassing and, and complex. And uh, at the time, you, you have to look at these, these states that popped up at, at a time where, you know, capitalist trade was starting to expand all throughout the globe. And uh, we really saw heavy handed imperialism. Um, more so in a way than what we see today. We see imperialism in, in a much more elastic and kind of uh, cooperational extent today, right? Within within markets and global markets and, and such. But in the past, it was a lot more heavy handed, right? Like, uh, I mean, essentially just countries would invade other countries and essentially enslave like entire populations. You saw like the Dutch do that in Africa. You saw, I mean, all kinds of countries did that to Africa, um, the oceanic region. You saw that. Um, and so when you look at a country such as Russia and places such as China, there was an actual warlike response in a way from the West, because essentially the, the, the ideological pretense of those revolutions was to, in a way, kind of decommodify how we deal with existing commodities and trade. Right. They were inherently against the the kind of capitalist practice of of international trade in that in that context and so um that was something that other countries would not accept if if we look at the uh marxist notion i think this is correct i, I really do um i know there's some debate here and there but i, I think this is the, the correct way to look at it the, the state and corporate interests are not separate they're not really a separate entity this is the mistake a lot of people like you'll see this on the right a lot this massive just it's a lie that like marxists love the state <laughs> marxists love uh the, yeah essentially they love their government they love the state uh they love big government that that could literally could not be further from the truth uh at all um uh marxists are incredibly um 
at least if you follow Marxism as a, as a theoretical foundation, right? Like in the text, like what actually is sort of Marxism? Uh, no, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly critical of, of state operations because the state isn't entirely separate from corporate practices. There's, there's lobbying in a, in a modern context. There's, um, you know, corruption, stuff of that nature. And when you look at these experiments popping up, Corporate interests were not okay with with countries essentially saying, no, we're not going to allow our population to be exploited or we're not going to, uh, you know, set up sweatshops here or, or, or uh, slave plantations here. You got to think about, you know, the the vast history of South America as well. Um, the the millions upon millions of dollars that the United States was pumping into, uh, you know, right wing opposition, really realistically, though, fascist kind of military dictatorships that resulted in, in the thousands of lives being lost uh, throughout um, South America and that kind of uh, and you know, that political battle, it, the same kind of response, I think, is of the real like the USSR and China. It, it's that I think in such a way, there is the response that workers don't actually want what they think they want in a lot of ways. I think that is a very true phenomenon um, that I think we saw pop up. And then the other one is true is that these states had to kind of resort. I don't even say had to, because that's also very, that's also a very debatable thing. But I, I think what has happened, states resorted into uh, a type of very autocratic authoritarian um, the society and social structuring, because in a way their logic, they had to because Europe, other countries, uh, the West in a way, would essentially just invade them like it all. And, and I think that is 100 percent true. Like if if there was no strong military presence from those, I mean, they would have been done for. So and, and there's some there's historical evidence for that, right? Like the Paris commune, the Paris commune was violently squashed. Uh, tons of people died. Um, uh, military essentially stepped in and squashed the whole thing. Uh, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, you see a lot of writing from, I mean, even Stalin wrote about the Paris Commune. Uh, Lenin certainly did. A lot of other political sort of Marxist quote unquote figures really cited the Paris Commune as real big evidence that we can't just, we can't just try and experiment these, these systems, these new post-capitalist systems, like we have to really like, you know, we have to essentially kind of organize and create like this strong sort of nation type, you know, system. And and I think that is the the sort of logic that uh, I think socialist kind of countries that were popping up through the past kind of had to to lean into and in 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 consequence they had to sacrifice a lot of what we would describe as like socialism right those practices like this they, they quashed uh oh man i mean they quashed uh labor unions all over I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that as well they quashed labor unions uh all kinds of things that were were um very like very antithetical to to, to socialism and Marxism, and it, it, I think this is uh, I think the I think the con I think the result that most I think that how we should think about this is that these sort of ideological ideals and, and these experiments that are coming out are way more complex than even what Marxists or 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 what um, I want to say maybe capitalists or. or uh, what what would I almost don't even know to describe like the the, the I, maybe liberals or the the sort of ideological camps of of who who kind of champion capitalism or the ideological camps that champion Marxism or or socialism sorry um, um, things are a lot more complex than I think either one often want to admit. The Frankfurt School shows up in a lot of right wing culture war talk now in the form of what they call cultural Marxism. Um, and, and then we also hear about postmodern neo-Marxism, I think is the, is the phrase that Jordan Peterson likes to throw around. When they're talking about this stuff, are they actually talking about, I guess this is a two-parter, are they actually talking about the Frankfurt School? Um, when they talk about cultural Marxism or postmodern neo-Marxism, are they talking about anything that looks at all like the Frankfurt School? And, 
And then why does it seem like these guys are this constant? I mean, I, there's obviously a lot that I disagree with about their their analysis and critiques. There are also, I think, interesting insights and so on. But but their role as this boogeyman on the right, as like the chief driver of everything that's wrong with America, creeping cultural Marxism and so on, seems overblown, both in terms of the the ideas that they actually have and the influence that Marcuse or Adorno or Horkheimer and so on actually have. So I guess what is what is going on? Why these guys? So I, I okay. I have the same question. I don't know. I think you've uh, you you were kind of saying like it's really overblown, dude. I, I I see that all the time. I see it all over the internet. Uh, who was it? James Lindsay, I think his name was talking about Marcuse. And he was really complaining. He was like, man, Marcuse and his legacy. I'm like. He hardly has a legacy. No one knows who Herbert Mar- like even relative like left wing students that I went to school with and other people I know. They don't even know who Herbert Marcuse is, really. Um, no, absolutely. I, I, I it is completely overblown. I, I don't think they have absolutely any idea what they're talking about as far as like the, the content of Marxism. Right. Um, I guess I can add to you, you brought up postmodern neo-Marxism. I think this is really ironic. It's hilarious. I don't. So a lot of people are like, that makes no sense. Like postmodern neo-Marxism. They're so different from each other that like how it's clear. Jordan Peterson has no idea what he's talking about. He doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. I think he admitted like he only read before a debate was Zizek. Like he read the communist manifesto. And that's like the only like kind of foundational work of marxism that he's ever really kind of read and uh it, that is just so you don't have to read the whole canon but that is definitely you you can't you can't get a real firm understanding from reading marxism just off of that um that said i think it's kind of ironic because i don't think like like the frankfurt school in a way kind of a little bit is i can kind of see how you know you can kind of look at the frankfurt school and kind of see this sort of kind of postmodern neo-marxist kind of thing i primarily not postmodern postmodern definitely i don't the frankfurt school almost everyone in the frankfurt school really is not a postmodernist uh whatsoever they still see philosophy and we can describe postmodernism in a philosophical context as like um in the way that like um modernist philosophers still see philosophy as like the the long linear teleological project of philosophy that builds upon itself and that uh kind of has these set goals of of understanding reality or understanding uh our inner subjectivity or whatever and that's the frankfurt school the frankfurt school are not postmodernists, and and they they have like set established uh, agreements to history and stuff of that nature um uh for example it's another thing jordan peterson said uh foucault and derrida they're both postmodernists. derrida is not a postmodernist at all um i I know that can it can probably it seems like i i i empathize a little bit with this like uh obviously i just don't know if jordan peterson's talking about this stuff in in good faith but for other people who even do i can see how you could think derrida might be a postmodernist, but he's not at, at all he still sees philosophy in a way very similar to like the frankfurt school foucault was certainly a postmodernist, though um where um sort of the process of, of history and these ideals being some like linked structural phenomenon that are are interconnected is is not apparent to foucault whatsoever and in that respect we can kind of see this sort of postmodern phenomenon exist so the frankfurt school isn't postmodernist at all they are neo-marxist i think you could describe them they are a type of newer sort of of marxism that is emerging um and uh, like you said cultural marxism i think that's probably a more accurate term right i i know that uh, other people have said well it's clear they don't know what they're talking about because there is no cultural marxism yeah i think if you're talking about like the marxism of you know marx and Engels, right um in the 1800s certainly i don't there's not really any of that but i think in the frankfurt school i think we could describe it as that i don't think that's a particularly inaccurate thing to say that like the frankfurt school is a type of cultural marxism but like you were saying the the, the frankfurt school has had real minimal influence on on actual sort of left-wing i wouldn't say left-wing thought as thought exists but as like something that captures real mainstream left-wing thought even though there isn't i I don't think there's really a mainstream like left it's just 
I know there's right wingers would certainly think so, but I I don't. I, there's the one. There's not a lot of power, right? Political power on the left. It just I, I think even you've uh, I think you've I think you're even familiar with that as well. It's like there's not really a lot of political power that the left has ever really held. Uh, maybe in the past during the times of like labor unions, maybe we can kind of see a more left leaning thing. But I think in a lot of ways, right wing people aren't. Eh. This is being generous because I think it might be ignorance more than anything. But maybe I can say that uh, I, I think in a way, yeah, I think right wingers are just and it, a lot of the the contemporary right are are are, are very uneducated and, and ignorant. But maybe if if they're not, maybe their concern just is culture, right? They're not concerned with the sort of political socioeconomic reality of what's going on. It is culture and you know, maybe that is the case. Like you, you don't you, like you see Ben Shapiro talking about Barbie for what, whatever, and the the culture war thing, and perhaps that is their concern. And um, and in that sense, I think maybe perhaps the left has more <laughs> has more uh, sway, at least amongst amidst the the youth than the right. But other than that, I don't really see. <laughs> I see the right as a as an inherently more powerful entity than the left. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.